Hey, salut friends. Today we are taking a look at Superstitious from Frederick Mall. Now, this is going to be one of those exhibition reviews because this fragrance has been discontinued. It has been rumored for a while that this is going to be re-released but nothing materialized. Taking into account many factors starting with Mall stepping down from the brand, the person who this is supposed to represent is not with us anymore. The mixed response it got and the increasing size of the collection, I think it is unlikely that it will return. Anyway, this is one of those collaboration fragrances from Edition Parfum. After the big commercial success of the brand in the beginning of 2010s, Moll wanted to work with people from other artistic areas who are as passionate as he is with perfumes. We have had three of them so far, which are supposed to be olfactory portraits of the people behind these brands. The first one was Dries Van Norton, the sophisticated, exquisitely charming sandalwood amber fragrance from 2013. This year we had Acne Studios, an alhedic futuristic Scandi pink musk fragrance based on John Johansson. In between, there was Superstitious, an alhedic floral from 2017, paying homage to Albert Albas, a Franco-Moroccan designer who worked at L'Avant and Yves Saint Laurent, hence the tag Albert Albas par Frédéric Moll. The perfumer behind is Dominique Hopion. Speaking of which, this is one of the 10 fragrances by Dominique Hopion for the house. It was quite a journey watching both of them collaborate on a wide variety of fragrances with synergy, be it florals or classic masculines or wood fragrances. As much as he gets hate for working on full-on commercial designers, you can tell the difference clearly when it is with Mall. I think Frederick also tries to challenge and push Ropion. Which is why as much as I respect some of his classics like Alien and Dune, I think his best work is with Moll, and what I consider to be one of the best collaborations in modern perfumery. Coming to the smell, this one opens with what I can only call a controlled explosion of aldehydes. I don't think I have smelled such a large amount of aldehydes in any fragrance so far. Such a huge, bold, unashamedly vintage opening. Obviously, the likes of Chanel No. 5 and No. 22 came to mind. Even Arpege from Lavon, the bottle colorways kind of look the same too. But they are more fizzy, effervescent and polite compared to this bombastic, sheer, slightly metallic and polished tonality. This is like a gamma ray explosion from outer space. More of a candle wax, ocean wave, noise kind of aldehydes. They are also not just in the opening pretty much stay from start to end, which I have not seen in many fragrances before. What also comes through is this abstract, vintage, yet futuristic scent profile. Mao said in an interview that he was trying to play Coco Chanel when it came to this fragrance, in that he did not give it a lot of thought and went with his instinct for approval when Ropion showed it to him after working on it for a year. I kind of get that. It does have some rough edges and intentionally left unfinished nuances and many notes that are not listed. The aldehydes are pretty potent for the first 10 to 15 minutes. This kind of overdose reminded me of the excess of Ria from Etat Libre d'Orange to some extent, though it is more controlled here. With the aldehydes, I also get this fruity peach, not a summer basket peach, more of a dry, sour, attached powdery and creamy peach skin-like smell which again adds to the vintage sheeper expression that the scent is going for. Then slowly from those beaming outbursts of aldehydes and peach, the white florals start to emerge, the prominent one being the Egyptian jasmine. It is a fresh yet dense fleshy jasmine here, somewhat green, fruity and waxy, endolic and musky too. That being said, the jasmine and in fact everything in this fragrance is perceived through those polished aldehydes. So it is kind of this hyper-realistic jasmine that stays throughout the life of the scent and keeps transforming. Then I'm also getting a prickly, cool, green, lemony, spicy rose joining the jasmine. There's probably more unlisted florals here because I'm getting a lot of facets to the floral heart. There could be some lily of the valley or orange blossom working with the jasmine from which I could be getting this shiny, watery, green nuances. Maybe some ylang adding to the fleshy texture. It is quite the voluptuous floral heart going on here. 
This cool peppery crystalline incense is also evident in the background. As the scent continues to dry down, the aldehydes on the white floral heart are still strong, especially the jasmine. I love jasmine not particularly in fragrances but in its natural form. You used to smell it every day in the garden, temples and on women wearing it in India. I prefer when it is used as part of a floral bouquet in fragrances. But here the style in which it is used is so intoxicatingly beautiful. It smells so rich and decadent and bold and does not shy away from its carnal side. Sometimes it even comes across Middle Eastern to me. Just like how roses are considered romantic and used to decorate the bedroom and whatnot in the West, jasmine is used in a similar fashion in the East before engaging in passion. It is as if the jasmine is mixing with the smell of an expensive dress, sweat, ashtray and whatnot. This feels like that idea of a sultry jasmine which is alive throughout the night and turns brown the next morning. I wouldn't even mind seeing the most overused word by brands to sell a fragrance in this case. This is what I would consider to be sexy. Coming back to the transition, the sourness of the florals that was present morphs to the woody base slowly. In this case, it is sandalwood. It is also made to smell somewhat fermented, smoky and musky the way it is integrated here. Not the typical creamy sandalwood. A big dose of patchouli which also has this polished glossy finish. Some smooth musky clean amber. Not overly resinous. More so a soapy, nondescript woody amber. Going further into the dry down, the potency of the aldehydes toned down a bit and becomes more and more woody. The jasmine also loses the little freshness it had in this cloud of amber, patchouli and sandalwood with some mossy, leathery touches underneath. In the final stages, the musky woodiness and the remnants of the florals is what is left and the evil eye on the bottle can finally rest. It is a grand fragrance, so performs accordingly, easily 10 hours, unisex leaning feminine in the traditional sense, of course. It is so upscale, ornate and opulent that I don't have a lot of occasions to wear it. So I kind of do the opposite and spray it on when I'm out and about in nature. The drawback here is evidently its discontinuation along with Reese Van Norton. Though I have seen it come up frequently online for lesser prices, not marked up as much as Breeze. That is a more easily appealing scent profile in comparison and so has entered the infamous investment fragrances territory at this point, going for more than 500-600 euros. In summary, I really enjoy this fragrance. The new vintage aesthetic is right in my lane. It has its optimistic side, but then also this cyberpunk dystopian vibe going on. Maybe it's just because it's one of my favorite movies. But this replicant character, Rachel from Blade Runner, in that black costume, is what I imagine when I smell this. Then there is the blend of humanistic and haute couture outlook it has, which adds to this mystical, abstract character of the fragrance, also building the contrast of being elegant and profane at the same time, which is a quality that is difficult to incorporate in a fragrance. The classic Chanel and Guerlain fragrances did it really well, but it is becoming rare in modern fragrances. More than all that, it is sincere to the person that it tries to represent. Albert Elbaz's sleek, fluid designs are appreciated for their sense of opulence, simplicity and individuality. He was inspired heavily by classic designs from the Belle Epoque era. He has also shared how he has these little superstitions in his life, whether it be cutting fabric in a particular way never giving anyone scissors, etc. Maul also has his own superstitions, be it smelling fragrances in an empty stomach in the morning, using the blotters in a particular way, or maintaining secrecy as to what he is working on and so forth. Them coming together to make this is what is special about it. In the 20th anniversary book, they also mention how this was one of the mods for Dries, and they had other ideas pitched by the likes of Maurice Roussel and Carlos Benaim for this fragrance. The decision to go with something this polarizing, and it is certainly one of the boldest from the house, just comes to show the level of commitment to the artistic expression both of them share. 
in what can be considered an honorable tribute to one of the highly respected creative designers in recent times. So that's been my review of Superstitious Albert Alba's Parfait Rick Mall. Thanks for watching. Take care and ciao.